in essence, it actually says that you are not the reason why people, uh, why customers buy your product. They essentially just need to get something done and they're hiring your product to get the job done. And either way, well, either they hire or they fire it if they don't get the job done properly. Welcome to This is Product Marketing, brought to you by Product Marketing Hive, a product marketing community that gives back. In this episode, Georgia Diaconesco, Product Marketing Manager at What3Words, and Krishmin Rind explore the jobs to be done in product marketing. Let's dive into it right now. Welcome to today's PMM Hive Talk with uh, Georgia Diaconesco. Uh, let's get started. Georgia, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Excited to be speaking with you today. So, um, yeah, the topic today is jobs to be done. And mm. uh, it's, a, uh, it's a fascinating topic. Uh, and uh, Georgia has, uh, has applied jobs to be done in, a, in a, at least a couple of different ways. So perhaps, Georgia, you could, you could start just by introducing yourself. Yeah. Hi, guys. So uh, I'm Georgia. I am uh, leading product marketing at what 3 words um, have had the opportunity, as Crispin said, to apply jobs to be done in quite a, a few companies. Um, had the opportunity to work in fintech, as well as um, an innovation hub within a large FMCG and in augmented reality industry. So a bit of a mix <laughs> of um, of uh, startups and and larger companies. So yeah, excited to be here today, and um, hopefully we have a chat that's helpful for you. <laughs> Great. So um, perhaps we can start with uh, what is jobs to be done? Yeah. It's a topic that's been popularized by Clay Christensen yeah. and many others, but maybe we can just start with the sort of the quick overview. What is jobs to be done? Yeah. Yeah. Jobs to be done um, is it's interesting. It's a methodology slash framework to essentially uncover unmet customer needs, so to speak. So it, it actually says that you are not the reason why people uh, why customers buy your product. They essentially just need to get something done and they're hiring your product to get the job done. And either, way, well, either they hire or they fire it if they don't get the job done properly. And uh, the very famous example of that is obviously with a, a quarter inch hole, like people need quarter inch hole. Uh, they don't need a quarter inch drill. They just need to get the job done, right? Um, drill is just one way of obtaining the result. So really our responsibility as product uh, marketing um, practitioners is to convince them that our solution is the best one to get the job done. So yeah, that's the essence of it. So um, jobs to be done has been and, and is applied a lot in innovation. The question that, that we might not get to the bottom of today, but which I'm, which I'm starting to probe is, what is the right role for jobs to be done in marketing, in, in, uh, in B2B marketing? And mm. one of the things that, that, that struck my attention um, in another talk that you gave was you were talking about how sometimes jobs to be done is a much better fit um, as you think about product than personas. Sometimes what mm. people want a product to do just doesn't have anything to do with who they are um, mm. at, at a persona level. It, it's not, it, it, it's whether it's, if it's a consumer persona, which is to do with demographics or it's a business persona about job role that just isn't related to the mm. use of the product. So can you talk a bit about the limitations of personas that yeah, you've come yeah. across and how, how jobs to be done offers an alternative view? Absolutely. I think w one way I would position jobs to be done is maybe as a complementary approach to personas. I think personas have, they have their use and it, 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 they definitely help teams kind of empathize with who they're dealing with and who they're addressing. You know, from my point of view, personas offer a snapshot in time of someone. What's a potential person that we might be speaking to? And in a B2B context, what, what's the user like? What's the buyer of the solution looking like? And I think jobs to be done from that perspective, of what, what it actually has to offer is the fact that, you know, it helps teams kind of come together around the process of how someone makes a decision. And sometimes, like you said, it doesn't really have anything to do with the fact that they're Sylvie, 40 years old, e-commerce manager, you know, it, it simply, I just need to get a, to a destination on time. Um, or a student who is at King's College, because we were talking earlier, you were at King's College, needs to get to his classes on time. I, I'm probably going to use the same product as Sylvie, right? Google Maps, just as an example, right? Right. So, yes, I think from that point of view, it does force teams and, and both product marketers and product managers and, and everyone kind of take a step back and look at essentially what are we here to do? What are we actually bringing to the table? So, yeah, I think it offers a dynamic view, a complex view of, of the, the journey 
of the specifics of getting that job done. Yeah. And yeah, I, I noticed in um, in Clay Christensen's book, the one that really yeah. writes, the whole book is about jobs to be done, uh, something about competing against luck. Or, oh, right. Or, that's the one, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, that's all about jobs to be done. And mm-hmm. one of the things he says, he says in that book is, I live in the suburbs, I have this demographic and so on and so forth. But for me, that would never be a reason why I would read the New York Times. Um, mm-hmm. He distinguishes between correlation and causation. Right. Um, because the book, as, as, as most of his books, it's about innovation, right? So, yeah. so it's like, if you're a marketer, sometimes you can get away with correlation. Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, generally speaking, people with this profile tend to buy these types of products. Right. And, and as a marketer, sometimes you don't care to look deeper. It's just like, well, okay, right. if that's true, then we can right. probably use that as marketing. Um, yeah. We don't really care, you know, what the reason is behind it. And, you know, he, he makes the point that none of these things would ever, mm-hmm. would ever be the reason why I read it because, you know, for example, an example he gave is if I have to go to the dentist and I want something to read while I'm waiting and I don't like mm. the magazines lying around in the dentist, then I might take a copy of the New York Times to read. It right. has a job, it has a very specific job for me, which is to, you know, spend some time reading something that's, that, that, you know, that, that's not too bad for a brief right. moment in a situation, in a yeah. circumstance that is very specific. Uh, and then, you know, he, he, he goes on to talk about how if, you do, if, if you're involved in innovation, then causation is absolutely fundamental. You have to, if you're going to innovate and create something new, make a new product, solve yeah. a new problem, you have to understand why. Makes perfect uh, sense. Uh, why people think, which is which is really missing from yeah. uh, from perser- personas, it's more correlation than, yeah. than causation. Absolutely, yeah. And so one of the other things which is really interesting, I think, in jobs to be done is that there mm-hmm. are um, there are functional jobs which which are sort of you know, what most of us would probably think about as being you know, sort of jobs, the purpose. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then there's also mm-hmm. emotional and social jobs, which are also an important part of jobs yeah. to be done, which I see at least in B two B personas as being missing. I haven't seen anything about that in those. Can, can you talk a bit about the emotional and social jobs? and jobs to be done and, and what's the point of those and how are they, you know, how are they important? Yeah, I think they're incredibly important. Um, you know, like you said, there you we're, we over focus on the functional side of things, like what exactly is the solution doing for my user, for the buyer of this, of this solution, right? The emotional job and specifically how people want to feel as a result of executing that functional job. So for example, the, the one that you just mentioned about the New York Times, I know it's not exactly B2B, I have a B2B to be example too. but specifically to that one is to avoid boredom while I'm waiting for the dentist or maybe just to distract myself because I'm really nervous to go in so that would be an emotional job uh, the social job is how people want to be perceived by others by doing that specific, or getting that job done uh, in your case maybe it's just to look very really well informed or you know if you're reading the New Yorker maybe you want to you know show belonging to a certain a group of people um, but that's that's kind of how um, how these two are different and the reason why uh, these play an interesting role is that once you sell in uh, or propose a solution to another business you are then able to per profile understand what emotional job and social job this would do for the for the user or for the buyer um, and it's it's really interesting to see kind of how those two things play out right because um, if you are proposing a solution to a buyer uh, who you know maybe they're the director of a group and they you know they um, have the uh, they have the say of whether a certain solution is adopted or not the emotional job might be giving them a sense of control over what happens the social job might be uh, you know, here I am using the latest technology and whatever, therefore I'm seen as um, someone forward thinking in my group of directors, for example. So those are things that kind of, that, that once you get to understand the nuances of that, even in a pitch, even uh, equipping a salesperson with that level of information or that kind of messaging can have a massive, a massive impact. So yeah. I think they're. I think they're. They're definitely two. Uh, two pieces of the puzzle that we haven't really. Um, we were still. We're still getting to <laughs> nailing down. Yeah, it's really interesting because I think in in certainly in B two B tech. I mean, it's it's not that people don't never think about emotions or or, or social no. stuff at all. I mean, obviously that's a big part of, for example, you know, customer programs. You know, in general, yeah. right. PR programs, awards programs. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, speakers bureaus, all of those things. But what's interesting with jobs to be done is that it sort of formalizes this at a much more, That's much right. more precise and detailed level. And you know, people actually have the job of going to think about it. Whereas right. it's like, well, you know, obviously people want to you know participate in PR stuff because it makes them famous, and you know, that's all you know, yeah. that's all sort yeah. of good. But this, it's it's a much more formal way of looking at it. 
Absolutely. Um, and they so, over the whole journey as well. So that's, that's something quite interesting to, to, you know, in the, in the whole buying process, let's put it in the buying process, they change as well. The emotional job maybe goes from feeling reassured to feeling, I don't know, in control or, or they, they actually change. So they're quite oh, yeah. dynamic. And I feel adding that level of what happens at each stage of that process can, can, can make a big difference in how we meet those needs as well. Oh, from yeah, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, that's yeah. clever. Um, so perhaps you could talk a little bit about how you've how you've applied jobs to be done. You know, what is what has your experience been? What have you uh, uh, what have you yeah. used it for? And, and uh, oh gosh, I've seen it in an interesting setting. So as a context, I was working in a company that was essentially an innovation hub within a, a, a large beauty company, and we entered a bid to create a digital solution on behalf of one of the uh, large brands. The essence or the end goal of that was to create a product that helps um, boost the e-commerce sales and help customers choose the, the right product for them. Um, and we decided early on that if we approach it like everybody else, every other consultancy coming into the game, then we're, we're not going to do well. Um, and it just so happened that our, our um, chief product officer uh, was very familiar, was actually a jobs to be done practitioner and had, had, had seen it in action. And at I, IBM, I think, and other companies. So uh, what he did is he brought in a consultancy um, that led us in a really, really insightful journey to, to actually apply jobs to be done um, and spent quite a bit of time um, uh, doing that. Uh, in the whole process, we came to the conclusion that uh, the business we're trying to help has one job <laughs> to serve its own customers, which is really interesting. So the way we positioned that was, here's how we're helping you serve your customers and, and that B2B space. Um, so it was, was less about what job we're getting done for the company. It's more about, here's how we're helping you get, you, get the job done for your, your customers. Um, so yeah, we, we obviously did quite a bit of customer journey mapping. Um, we, uh, for, you know, we mapped out, did the job mapping. So, uh, putting all the six stages, define, prepare, execute, monitor, modify, and conclude. Um, you guys can read later about this, but, uh, you know, we went through all the, all the steps of creating the job steps, creating the sub steps of that ran 3,600 interviews or something like that in four different markets, which was incredible. Uh, and, and, uh, obviously costly <laughs> it was it needed quite a bit of resource um and uh you know asked uh, all of these people to give each of these steps an important score and satisfaction score and then from that we understood where in that whole decision making process uh, where's what's the the opportunity where could we excel? Where is the pain point? Where what's what's missing and and what's hurting? <laughs> um, so from that, we we took all those insights. We designed a tool that essentially married um, both AR, um, artificial intelligence, and facial recognition. It was like a whole mix, and um, it was it was really interesting. It was really cool. We won a Webby Award with it this year um, in the apps, mobile, and voice section. So yeah, it was really uh, it was really interesting to see that play out and come to life in the product. Um, yeah, <laughs> quite wow, an extensive sounds... process, I must say. Quite a few months. Yeah. Um, so what, what do you think you were able to uncover? Sounds like there was a huge amount of research. Yeah. What do you think you were able to uncover with that research using the jobs to be done methodology mm -hmm. that, 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 uh, you know, might've been harder to get to if you were, if you were thinking about things in a different way? Yeah, because it was a beauty brand. We were essentially talking about helping people choose, uh, a beauty product, we realize that people um, don't need beauty products. They just want to look the way they want. And the way people get that job done can be very different, right? Uh, it could be maybe buying a dress. It could be buying, you know, um, something completely different. Maybe it's, you know, um, changing something else about their appearance, whatever it is. Um, and all of a sudden, it kind of shifts your, um, uh, your way of thinking in terms of what's my market, because all of a sudden, you're not you're not competing against other beauty brands. You're competing against very different, very different players 
and that allows you to tailor that messaging and make it really effective. Um, and so that was really interesting. I think instead of presenting something that the company wanted to be presented with, the business, the, the brand that we were designing this for, we positioned it as we're creating something that your customer wants and here's how it serves you. Um, and I think that was kind of the, the aha moment where, where they were kind of like, okay, we understand. You've been listening to, to the people we're trying to serve. Um, we're on board. So yeah. I think that that was the the the, the highlight of the of the whole thing because um, it, it went from serving products to um, getting in the mind of uh, getting into the decision making process of that actual person. Yeah, yeah, because it, it makes it, it changes the it changes the way that we think about competition, right? Absolutely. Because if you, uh, yeah. Which is which is really interesting. You know, if you, if you look at a product competition, you think about okay, here's my product in this category. What are the competing products in, in, mm. in similar categories? But if you think about it in oh. terms of a job someone is doing, yeah. then the competition is often completely on, you know, nothing, nothing to do with the uh, product that yeah. you have. It's, yeah, it's just, absolutely. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it could be from a different category. So now all of a sudden you think of, of satisfying that need in, in different ways. So, um, so yeah. I think it's a really interesting, uh, really interesting approach. And maybe, maybe we couldn't have gotten that from from personas. I think that would have not been necessarily the immediate result of working with personas, which is why I, I, I mentioned earlier. Um, it's it's great to complement them and to to look at it from multiple angles. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, because yeah, the competition for someone sitting in the dentist who's reading the New York Times to pass the time. You yeah. know, might instead uh, be playing a video game on their phone. That's right. Or, yeah. Um, Fortnite yeah. on your mobile. <laughs> Fortnite yeah. on your mobile. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Yeah. Or Instagram. But not, but not, on, not on your Apple mobile at the moment. <laughs> not on your Apple <laughs> mobile. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's yeah, that's really interesting. And, and so something else that you, that you that you suggested there, and this this all ends up relating to innovation, is sort of segments, mm -hmm. customer segments that end up being sort of job job derived customer segments yeah. rather than um, product oriented customer segments. So, so innovation certainly that works really well with jobs to be done. And, and when I was when I was first reading about the jobs to be done material, it really reminded me of some work that I'd seen uh, from well from, from from about twenty years ago when I was when mm -hmm. I was working in Paris. Uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Michael Thompson there, who's a professor I've noticed uh, uh, since then. Which 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 somehow doesn't doesn't entirely surprise me because he was he was you know very. Uh, sort of ahead of his time, I think, in, in in how he was thinking about things like user experience and stuff in the in the nineties, right. and um, he uh, he applied a method called contextual design, mm -hmm. which is which is still used today, but it's it's based on at least it's a it's a sort of user experience oriented um, uh, method, but it's it's really based on and then the, the commonality with with jobs to be done is it's really based on observation a lot. So mm -hmm. the idea was. Yeah. You can ask customers questions and they'll tell you whatever they tell you. But when you actually watch them working, when you observe them, you discover things that they would never tell you. Um, and, yeah. you know, in particular, you know, one of the and, and, and this was in a context of B2B tech. So uh, we were um, uh, he went off and did an observational study for several weeks with a, with a very small number of customers. So it was it's very much heavier uh, than, you know, running a customer advisory board. You've got 15 customers, takes you a day. This is more like you know two weeks sitting sit, sitting observing one customer, mm. um, but mm. but looking for work model in, in yeah. textual design. It's about how do they do their jobs, and what you're really looking for is uh, is, is is the things that happen in between software products, um, outside of software products, workarounds in particular. It's like you know uh, what why don't you do this in the software? Well, you know because it's you know how do people really use the software? You you do all these features That's and then right. you discover what they really yeah. do is they press the download to Excel button. Oh wow. yeah yeah yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> Oh lord yeah yeah. And so the amount of time you know, I've seen this in in user in uh, UX research yeah. So so yeah so so how do you how do you see what what are the what are sort of main ways in which you see jobs to be done uh, as a method for driving driving innovation discovering unmet needs and, and you know, that, that, that sort of thing. Yeah. I think the, where, where jobs to be done shines is that it, it plays a huge role in helping us interpret the, the data we have, right. And, and making sense of how people make decisions. I think that's the, that's what the dream of every marketer is just trying to get into the minds of, of, um, of the people is trying to, to advertise to. Um, what I think it does really well is that it shines a light on the discrepancies between what people say and what people do. 
because it analyzes the step-by-step -step, um, you know process of getting that job done um, it's it's similar to like the sequence model in, in contextual design I'm not a specialist in contextual design but reading into it it, it feels like that kind of sequential um, analysis and the uh, you know looking at also the the sub steps of each of those uh, steps to get the job done uh, feels like you're getting into a level of detail that allows you to almost disseminate like what's the where where does it hurt and how important is this particular thing to you um, so it forces um, it forces us as product marketers to take a step back from the way we usually frame the market and the way customers see us and look at exactly what they're doing what you were just saying and how they actually make the make the decision um, and it boils it down to the to the basics of it. Like, what are we here to do? What job are we getting done on on their behalf? Because what what happens a lot is we tell a story to ourselves about what what our product does, and then, like you said, you run user testing, and then you see people actually using it completely differently, or or you know, just it's just it's just not the way you you saw it happening. Um, and um, I think that's that's kind of the the where jobs to be done adds adds a lot of value uh, in in driving that discontinuous innovation. Um, it makes me think of the milkshake experiment, which you probably you've you've for sure um, read through. Yeah, in, talk, in, about uh, 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 talk about yeah, that. Talk about yeah, the milkshake experiment, which I, you know it, I always kind of end up going to the same to the same exact you know uh, to the same example um the story is of a fast food uh, restaurant chain essentially that wanted to uh, improve its milkshake uh, sales so the company basically segmented the market both by product so milkshake segment and by demographics like what would be a typical persona of a milkshake drinker and what they what they did is they asked people who fitted that that persona or that demographic to list the characteristics of an ideal milkshake. Um, and the would-be kind of customers uh, answered as honestly as they could, but they basically couldn't really improve the, improve the sales. However, by observing who went in, uh, in that, just call it a restaurant or whatever, uh, who went in to buy a milkshake for a period of an entire day, they noticed that in the morning there were a lot of people commuting to work. Uh, buying milkshakes, and then in the early afternoon, parents with children uh, kind of coming in. And personas obviously were a bit, it was a bit of a weird moment because all of a sudden you have very, two very different segments coming in for the same product to get the same, to well, roughly the same job done is to fill their tummy, <laughs> to, to, you know, to feel quite full. Someone was using it as a, as a substitute for breakfast, the the young parents with the with the kids were using it as a kind of early dinner kind of in between snack, uh, and that's something that you know when you see it happening and when you see the actual process or the actual job to be done in motion, it it, it kind of shows you um, things they probably weren't thinking of. And there was before. also there was yeah. also the idea in that in that study uh, of um, the milkshake being um, for the people who came in in the morning they were. They 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 were intrigued because they didn't they didn't they didn't understand you know why were they coming in the morning to buy to buy milkshakes and when they sort right, of started right. started I don't know perhaps not following them around but 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 you know <laughs> pro, probing yeah. you know probing them them uh, more deeply it sort of turned out they they were mm -hmm. looking for something to do in their car as well right that was oh okay, you know, right, that yeah. was yeah. that was another thing they were trying to solve for is they were they they had a long commute to work they they did want right. to, they did want to eat something. Um, but also, yeah. they sort of wanted something to do because kind of they were driving American driving. cars. This wouldn't be a problem in Europe yeah. because you've got a gear stick, so you know what to do with both hands. But but yeah. but, but in the US, you've got one hand <laughs> one hand free, and so they wanted something yeah. something they could do with that hand, um, right. uh, occupy themselves on the way to work. Um, and then again, the competition is, is is really different between between the morning segment and the afternoon segment. In the morning, it's like, yeah. what am I going to do with my hands? And, and you know, the, you know, donuts kind of make my steering wheel sticky. Um, uh, and then, oh gosh. Uh, yeah. you know, and then in the afternoon, it was the, the people coming in with kids, right? So it was like, you know, what, yeah. you know, what am I gonna, you know, you need to keep them quiet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wanted to talk about my kids, and, and the alternatives would be would be really different. Um, yeah, yeah. So really interesting. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. Now, so it's it's very interesting. To, so jobs to be done can cert, can certainly be applied to innovation. But one of the things I would I would like to get your view on is, you know, what sort of under what 
what sort of company can can apply jobs to be done as a method mm-hmm. for innovation? Because now I'm, th- I'm looking at jobs to be done, then I'm thinking about you know lean startup, you know small companies mm-hmm. trying to move fast. I'm wondering is this a fit or not? You know, when I think about big companies like I worked in Microsoft, and they have a whole yeah. you know the other question is it's not just which company can apply it, but what roles in a company should apply it? Because it's a kind of a research methodology, isn't it? it it's, not, it's, not, it's not exactly product management. It's not, exactly, it's not really product marketing. It's, yeah. Now, in Microsoft or mega, mega companies, there's an answer to that question. Perhaps the company that you are um, do, doing work for in, in the Netherlands as well, if it's a huge company, they have like innovation departments or research departments or you know, mm-hmm. people, who, people who have that job to be done in the company. And, and Microsoft yeah. has that. They have like UX, you know, research, innovation people yeah. Yeah. Um, who are very good and, and, and you know, who, um, who would do this stuff. You know, they're, they're the people who, who can sit down for two years and study this stuff, you know, for, for, a, right. you know, for a product. Yeah. But, can afford but, <laughs> but a startup, it, yeah. you know, I think about lean startup, someone who's in you know, early stage of funding, would they have time? Yeah. Um, what do you think about this? What, what, what sort of company can, can usefully apply this? Yeah, I think the beauty of jobs to be done, I think it's uh, the the flexibility. I mean, there's, I know that there are practitioners that obviously go through the painful process of doing all those thousands of interviews and doing, you know, um, and by all means, I think those are, um, uh, they're entirely in their right to do it. And I think it's it's fantastic if you do have the resources, even if you don't have the resources. I know of people who have used it uh, in their startup to essentially as an something that was quite proved to be instrumental for them uh, in the early days when the core product was still being defined and the, the I guess the market sizing they were still trying to figure out what to do um, and it started as simply as doing a customer journey map and right. talking to people and uh, asking them how did they go about solving a certain problem in the company that they were, you know, the type of companies that they were uh, thinking of serving. So they had an initial suspicion that, oh, I think people cannot, you know, e-commerce, man- for sake of example, e-commerce managers have trouble with this. Uh, once they went to actually speak with them and going through, they they started to see the patterns emerging um, and they knew that they, that's an area that they wanted to further uh, dig deep equally i think we what we've seen uh in the in the past few years is uh certain platforms enabling um enabling virtually any startup to do user testing for cheap or even for for free in some aspects and i think that's that's the beauty of of um using technology uh, for that so i think it is it's definitely uh doable for uh, for startups, what I would advise is understanding um, the the approaches to jobs to be done. Uh, I've in what I've read so far, I know that there's at least two different approaches, if not more. But starting with a customer journey map, talking to people, um, creating maybe even a small customer advisory board seems to me like a, a fantastic uh, fantastic start. Uh, booking Zoom calls, share findings, iterate, ask people. I think it's it's something that every startup can do, um, and it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be uh, costly. Once you identified uh, the struggle of getting a certain job done, you know you uh, you know that the customer is on the lookout for a solution, and they most likely will be will want to talk to you. So yeah, I, I think there is a lean way to apply this. Um, and sometimes it's a founder and someone who's helping him with marketing and that's fine. Mm. <laughs> but uh, but doing a bit of the groundwork or even you know being part of a community like the PMM Hive, for example, fantastic way to um, go and ask questions and, and get some, some, some good input for sure. Yeah. yeah, I think that's important. Is it I'm, makes me optimistic. You seem to believe there is a way to uh, to, to sort mm. of simplify it down to a, a, applying maybe in some cases applying the principles more than the than the absolute details of the whole research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The outcome driven innovation process, for example, can be a good backbone to that, uh, and they they tend to simplify it in like six steps. Kind of defining the roughly defining what the job to be done is. Look at what the cust- the second step is to look at the customer needs. The third one is to figure out which of the needs is more important uh, and which one isn't really met at all, um, but is crucial. Uh, and then you kind of look at segments of opportunity and then start working on the marketing and and, and the product strategy of how you might uh, begin to to solve that. 
but uh, prototyping, rapid sprints, all these things, I think they're uh, rapid sprints, uh, sprints. Uh, I think they're, um, they can be quite, um, quite easy to implement and, and get the, get the job done. <laughs> yeah. A couple of final, final questions and final thoughts on it. So are there, are there drawbacks with uh, jobs to be done and, and uh, what would, what would they be? Yeah, definitely. There's always drawbacks with any, any single tool. It's, uh, it has its, um, its uh, downside as well. It, with jobs to be done, there's two things. I would say one of them is that it doesn't really give you yes or no answers. It doesn't really tell you, hey, your customer wants this feature, but doesn't want that feature. It's not as simple as that. Uh, but it, it, it facilitates iteration rather and helps you identify opportunities of how you might address that specific struggle of, of your customer. Um, so, um, I, you know, it focuses on unearthing those, those needs. It doesn't spell out per se you should, they, they're using for, they're looking for this feature versus the other thing. And the other drawback, depending on how big your team is, is internal education. There are always going to be people who are not familiar with it. Sometimes that uh, jobs to be done can be a bit of a head turner for a lot of people uh, that are not familiar with it, uh, or it might feel like it's too complex and it's going to be a huge costly project. Um, so getting the commitment can be a bit of a, a hurdle, but, uh, but it's worth it. Even if it's like a, a, a couple of hours session, just talk about what it is and whether it's, yeah, whether it's useful. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that was really interesting. Um, Thank yeah. you so that much. Was... I love talking about jobs to be done. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a very wide topic, and and I feel like the we we're still uncovering the best way to to apply this in in, in companies, and and do it fast <laughs> and efficient. So. Thank yeah. you very much for uh, uh, for helping us to uh, dig into this interesting topic. Thank you for the invitation. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for tuning in to This is Product Marketing, brought to you by Product Marketing Hive, a product marketing community that gives back. Check out our website, productmarketinghive.com, to join our community, meet fellow product marketers, and access free resources, including training, playbooks, templates, and events. If you enjoyed our podcast, please subscribe and give a five-star rating on the platform of your choice. See you next time.